Hello, and welcome to Every Possible Angle, a new conversation series where we're going to be delving into the world of transplantation. We're going to be discussing with community members from every part of the field to get a better understanding of what's going on in the space. My name is Michael Tajima, and I'm joined here today by my colleague, Pratik Patel. Thanks, Michael. This is a really exciting time in organ transplantation. We're able to do things that we couldn't do just a year ago, and Dr. Kuhleman, our guest today, is going to be talking about the concept of time shifting. Uh, and he's going to talk about how his center is able to use this concept to do some really amazing things. With that, welcome Professor Lawrence Kuhlemans of the University of Leuven Hospital in Belgium. We're, we're really excited to, ha to have this conversation today. Hello, Michael. Good evening. Hello, Pratik. Good evening. Very nice talking to you, and thank you for the opportunity of the, of the podcast, which is, which is a terrific idea, I think. Um, thank you for making time. Um, we're, we're really excited partly because the Leuven Lung Transplant Program, you're, you're doing some really exciting things right now uh, and impressive work these days in terms of uh, advancing the research in lung preservation and lung transplantation. But I was wondering if we could start just by you telling us a little bit about your journey in lung transplantation, uh, how you got started, why, why lung transplantation as a career? So thank you for the introduction. I indeed work as an academic lung transplant surgeon at the University Hospitals of, of Leuven, where I also had the lab of thoracic surgery and, and lung transplant, which Pratik could visit a few months ago. And so I'm really fortunate to work there because we can really take the clinical questions that we encounter in the field of lung transplantation to the lab, to our small animal models, try to study them, and then try to find a solution that can be incorporated in daily clinical practice. Because there are so many challenges still in the field of, in the general field of transplantation that need to be answered. And such an exciting field of research, it's really a privilege to work in, to work in, that, in that field. And one of the questions we had simultaneously with the uh, introduction of the, of the Langard technology was about temperature. One of the most interesting findings we made over the last year was mostly about uh, the rewarming ischemia during the implantation of a lung during transplantation and how this ischemia and um, this, this, this temperature change affected the lung while it was still not perfused and how also time was critical in the deterioration of the, of the organ. You know? Absolutely. I think, I think for a long time, preservation has been uh, sort of uh, assumed in transplantation for the last 50 years. It's been a sort of colder is better mentality with, with transplantation. But your, your lab's been now paying a lot more attention to temperatures and the metabolic processes as well as injury going on during uh, the preservation period. I was wondering, uh, maybe you could tell us a little bit about uh, your career, how did you get into lung transplantation? What's been your journey to, to uh, really uh, get into this space? Well, thanks for that question, Michael. So as a, as a young resident, I had the opportunity to practice uh, and work on a, on a PhD in the lab of abdominal transplant uh, surgery in Leuven, where I focused mostly on, in the field of intestinal transplantation on immunology. Um, it was a very exciting um, field because the intestine is quite similar to the lung. They're both what I call barrier organs. Right? So they are in contact with, with our environment. And for that, the immunology is, is, is really um, an exciting field to study because of the strong innate immune response of these, of these organs. And what I encountered in the field of transplantation was that it was a relatively young field with very exciting questions. Mm -hmm. What you're actually doing in, in a transplant is transferring one organ from a person who's not genetically predisposed to be connected to the recipients. And you do something which is biology, bi from a biological point of view, doesn't make sense at all. And mm -hmm. that's why you're encountered with questions and challenges that are really on the edge, not only of transplantation, but are on the edge of medicine. And what you can see is that Trying to push that, that, that edge further, trying to push the field, does not only improve the field of transplantation, but improves the whole field of medicine. There are many discoveries in transplantation that find their way later on in the general field of, of medicine. Right? So already that aspect made me very passionate and interested. And then the other aspect that it is a young field and that there is not a real competition between different 
disciplines and, and researchers in transplantation, there are so many ongoing questions and challenges that, that the competition is not as, as harsh as, for example, in, in other medical fields like, like oncology or vascular surgery. Um, this is more an open field of open interaction and communication. And also that, that I, liked, I liked a lot, I must say. I, I fully agree. I think the, the international and, and uh, collaboration across this community has been fantastic. Uh, it's been a, a great experience, at least for me. Yeah. I mean, I think it's interesting you talked about your background as a resident, right? When you're a resident, it's in your formative years. You get exposed to so much in medicine. Um, and it's really interesting that you were drawn specifically to the field of transplantation because it's essentially less chartered than other parts of medicine. Uh, did you have any other interest, like besides transplant, that you know that you were deciding between, and then you ultimately decide to go with transplant? So we were trained in, in in general surgery. That's how our training program in in Belgium looks like. And then I was I was interested in transplantation, mostly from a from a research perspective, mm -hmm. and then in thoracic surgery in, in in general. So I was trained as a thoracic surgeon simultaneously because it was especially the, the organ, the lung that attracted me a lot because of its unique physiological capacities. For example, if you compare it to, to a kidney, which mm. is more like, like a filter uh, mechanism or, or liver, which is more a metabolic mechanism, the lung has the unique capacity of, of, of this uh, being a privileged organ with the storage capacity of the oxygen, which is then diffused and then you have that perfusion. And so don't only think as a surgeon, but you think as, the, as a physician and as a physiologist and an immunologist at the same time. So I was really attracted, not specifically to, to, to a certain profession, but more, let's say, to an organ. And then everything came together in the field of transplantation. So the real passion is in, in lung transplantation. I feel like um, that sort of mentality to be willing to go into a pioneering space, a space that's not fully defined yet, and there, there's still so many um, untapped questions. That, that's got to take a certain mentality, but but also I, I'd imagine it's helpful to be in a place that's very supportive of uh, research and and answering those questions that that really can can take that and I, and at least partake when you visited Leuven, it sounded like that was that was really the environment you've cultivated there. Yeah, I I have to agree with Michael. When I visited, I remember the experience or the few days, you know, every single day we were, you know, going between the lab to, you know, the clinic. I was observing you go literally between seeing patients to being in the research lab within, you know, within a matter of, of a few minutes. Um, but I also saw, frankly, the culture of the, uh, the, of the younger generation that you were training. They really shared in on that, you know, interest and that passion. So uh, I, I'm really interested to know if, if the training model that, you, you know, you have at Leuven how that came about, because I noticed a lot of the trainees were pursuing both an MD and a PhD. Is that is that something that kind of has organically evolved as a focus for Leuven, or is that you know is there a certain reason why that that exists today? No, well, so I came back from a fellowship in Zurich in 2019, and I got the responsibility of of the lab of thoracic surgery and lung transplant at that time, but there were no. Um, no PhD students at that time in the lab. So, mm. so we had to start somehow of, of, of scratch with the experience I had. And the experience I had was in fact the template of how I foresee our lab in the future, which means that you do a simultaneous training, both in surgery as well as in research, but you have dedicated time for, for research and mm. the best um, way to, to organize is, to, is to, to offer to a young motivated colleague an actual PhD. A PhD, you have to see it like a, a form of, of education. It's not about the title. It's a form of education where you really develop into a mature, independent researcher who can not only ask questions, but also formulate hypotheses, translate it to a certain research model, try to find the results and also present them to, to the audience and, and write them down in, in, in a paper and then mentor them again to another generation. And so in this model, I was raised by, by my mentor, Professor Jacques Piren, who was raised himself in the, in the, in the 90s in the US. Yeah? And this is the model that he, that he was raised in the US. He brought it to Leuven and this is the model I took over to raise the new generation of, of uh, surgeons and, and transplant surgeons. And I must say, 
that, that I'm very, very fortunate to have found motivated, passionate young colleagues, because these young colleagues, no matter how old the university gets, these people always stay at the same age. Mm -hmm. yeah? We have a university of 600 years old, but the students are still at the same age as 600 years ago. <laughs> and these are the ones that, that, that put the questions forward. These are the ones that, that challenge you and, and drive the real research. And this is a really stimulating environment. And now our lab has grown up to 28, uh, 28 researchers focusing on intestinal transplantation, uh, multivisual transplantation, lung transplantation, lung volume reduction surgery, um, fascia transplantation. So it's really a, a stimulating environment. We have a lot of interaction between different disciplines also. It's not only surgery, it's basic science, it's pulmonology, it's anesthesiology. All these disciplines together work uh, very closely. I feel, I feel like that mixing of different disciplines is that's often where innovation happens, mm -hmm. you know. For us, I think that's been very stimulating things, crossing different organs, working in different spaces. Uh, having that mixing of different disciplines is where you, you find those, those innovative and interesting ideas. They can really move the field forward. Yeah, no, I agree. I don't know if you know, but Michael has actually a, a background in mechanical engineering, and he worked in aerospace engineering before, wow. uh, be, uh, you know, joining a, a medical technology. So couldn't agree with you more. You used to design satellites, but no, that's, that was a long <laughs> time ago. Um, can I ask you, you know, in terms of some of the, the innovations in, in the field, um, how do you see what's going on in the field? Uh, one of the areas that I think has been uh, of a, a, a lot of interest lately is around preservation, around uh, uh, controlled hypothermia. Uh, can you tell me a little bit? I know Pratik was over doing some research projects with, with your team. How, how has temperature become more uh, part of the consciousness of, of the transplantation process at Leuven? So I think that from the beginning of transplantation and even before, the question and the interest in the field have, have always been quite similar. Yeah? Already Alexis Carrel, before the first clinical transplant was performed, was developing some kind of, of machine perfusion together with Charles Lindbergh in order um, to preserve organs. Yeah? But what we see over the, over the last decade is that the technology is there. Yeah? Mm -hmm. and if your background as mechanical engineer, you will, you will indeed see that, that we were able as a, as, a, as a human race to develop techniques that were transportable, that could be incorporated in daily life. And, and that makes these ideas and thoughts that were already there for 50, 60 years, that made them transportable, translated to the actual, actual daily practice. It's not only in medicine that this is happening. This is happening throughout different fields in our, in our daily life. And so also the whole idea about temperature, it's not, a, it's not a new idea. Already in the beginning of the 90s in Toronto, in the lab of Joel Cooper, they were doing good, strong research on preservation. And it was thought and hypothesized that the colder you preserve an organ, the better the function of the lung would be after a perfusion. However, to, they, to their surprise, when they analyzed several temperatures, they found that by accident, preserving a lung at 10 degrees outperformed lungs preserved at 4 degrees. And so a whole line of research early in the 90s, not only in Toronto, but also in Japan, came out to find the ideal temperature of, of lung preservation, especially for the lung, in contrast to kidney and liver, because the lung is such a privileged organ. It's a privileged organ because it has this unique oxygen storage capacity. And because of this oxygen storage capacity, it has the potential to maintain the aerobic metabolism and preserve better the cell function during preservation in contrast to an organ without that oxygen storage. Mm -hmm. And so already in the beginning of the 90s, they, they were convinced that the best temperature to preserve an organ was not on ice at four, three, two, zero degrees, but slightly higher, which is the concept of what we know now as controlled hypothermic preservation which is somewhere in the range between 4 and 10 degrees. We do not exactly know yet what the best temperature might be. And there are some indications in an old paper from Nakamoto, I think, in 1993, which showed with a mathematical model that the best temperature is probably between 7.6 and 8.4 degrees. <laughs> so we still have to do some research there to find exactly out what the best temperature is. And, and so the ideas were there. 
but there was no technology to incorporate them to incorporate them in the, in the clinical practice and this technology has now evolved over over the over the last years can, can i ask you I, I... Across organs, we're seeing a big impact on temperature, on clinical outcomes, and and uh, transportation, total ischemic times. One of the things that I'm, I'm really curious, particularly with lung, that when you're talking about lungs and intestines being barrier organs with that strong innate immune response, I think in the early days that colder or better is, is philosophy was was heavily driven around uh, sort of a, a metabolic thought. I mean, we call it ischemic time. There's this thought of reducing metabolic activity, reduce metabolic injury. Um, but I feel like what, what the current trends are are about reducing any form of injury, potentially freezing injury, and, and, and kicking off, particularly in lung and, and intestine, that, that, that strong uh, innate immune response uh, to lead to edema and, and inflammatory cascades. Where do you, uh, how do you see that balance point and these different mechanisms playing in regards to the temperature? So I think that indeed what you touch there is a very important uh, aspect, and that's ischemia or perfusion injury. Mm -hmm. And of all organs, the lung and the intestine are the most vulnerable to this ischemia or perfusion injury, which is nothing more than a cytotoxic storm that is released upon reperfusion of an ischemic organ. And what you have to consider is that what is long thought to be the golden standard of preservation and the golden standard of this ischemia time was ice cold preservation, but ice cold preservation means freezing cellular injury mm -hmm. with a mm -hmm. direct impact on mitochondrial health, mitochondrial swelling and the mitochondria, you have to understand that's the energy safekeeper of the cell, which is completely destroyed. Yeah? And so this immediate effect of, of freezing a cell and really injuring the cell and in the end, it ends up in a lot of reactive oxygen uh, an oxidative stress, which is released at the moment of hyperfusion, will lead to a lot of ischemia hyperfusion injury. Yeah? And especially the lung and the intestine are so vulnerable because of their strong innate immune response and release of, of, of cytotoxins at this moment of, of hyperfusion. That, that, that's, that's one important aspect. And we also have to consider, in a side note, that preserving a lung on, on ice is not preserving a lung on four degrees. We have shown during the last year in our clinical grateful study, every time a lung came back from um, a procurement and it was preserved on ice, we took it out of the ice cooler, which is nothing more than a camping box filled with ice, not really anno 2023, but still this is the current practice. It came out and we immediately took a surface temperature and because it was a lung, we were able to introduce a very small probe into the lumen, bronchial lumen of the um, lower lobes. And what we found out was that ice and immediately measuring temperature afterwards resulted in temperature of around zero to one degrees. And we know that zero to one degrees has a severe impact on, on cellular uh, injury. So Dr. Kulumans, that's really fascinating kind of what your team is seeing when lungs are preserved on ice. You mentioned when they come out of ice storage that they're not four degrees, that they're closer to zero essentially. Can you just share about how exactly the lungs are packaged uh, when we talk about ice storage? Because there is some variation across the clinical community where some teams put ice within the bags and some people don't put that ice in the bags. So I think we have to consider that, that the standard mode of preservation has been ice over the last 30, 40 years. Any, any form of ice, mostly in a, in a classic camping box filled with liters and liters of ice, which is really not slushy ice, but is really, really ice that you find on, on the North Pole. Yeah? And so what I think is that we should abandon ice completely. And I say this with... Uh, a bit of an adagio, leaving the ice age behind. <laughs> You're really leaving the ice age behind now. It's time to leave it behind and to, to go for a more controlled way of preserving and maintaining the temperature that is surrounding the lung. You know, what we have done over the past 30 years in Leuven is the camping box filled with ice and then you have these lungs. We pack them individually, inflated, and we pack them classically in three bags. So you have an inner bag, which is uh, filled with preservation solution at an ice cold temperature. Um, and then you have a, have a second bag where you have some 
ice cold water. Sometimes they pour in some ice and then you have a third bag just to keep the sterility to hand over the organ after the after preservation. And so what we are doing now is shifting towards the device of the of Langard Paragonics, where you have this 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 cooler where with a with a certain temperature maintained at around six degrees, and we fill it again with two individually packed lungs, so which means six bags in total, and we pour around two liters of preservation solution in total. Um, well, not two liters of preservation solution. We have one liter of preservation solution per lung, and then one liter of um, cold water around that preservation solution. So in total, we have around four liters of, um, of, of water or preservation solution together with the lungs in the, in the, in the cooling box. Absolutely. And, and I'm curious, how has this been uh, used and implemented in your clinical practice? I know we've worked together on the, the Grateful study and uh, measurements of, of cold temperature opposed to ice, but you've also started to implement controlled hypothermia as part of uh, your practice. How, how has that indication been used? How where where do you have you uh, implemented that? Well, it was a bit of serendipity again. All good things in research happen with serendipity. So what we found out, I think now already two years ago, when we did retrospective analysis of our Leuven series, we found out that actual implantation time of lung, which means the moment when a lung is deflated and exposed to warmer temperatures, up to the, the body temperature, that we could see that the longer you need to implant an organ, and in fact it was in, it was the lung, that the more PGD the organ developed afterwards. So we knew and we understood that there was a link between timing, temperature, and uh, ischemia and perfusion injury. And so we set up a study, which is called the Grateful Study, and we wanted in a first phase to assess to which temperatures and which timings the lungs is ex are exposed during the, the implantation. And to do that, we didn't only focus on the implantation, but we wanted to, to visualize the whole process of ex vivo preservation, starting from the donor until the reperfusion. We've even taken biopsies of the lung one hour after reperfusion. So we set up a whole uh, clinical protocol for that. And exactly at that moment, uh, we were approached by, by the company with the introduction of, of the lung guard. You had the studies from, from Toronto and Vienna coming out with their preservation, bridging the night. And so everything came together. And we decided after the first initial phase of feasibility to switch the entire system in, in Leuven and to do really stop transplanting at night. In the first phase, we uh, set together with all involved partners, anesthesiology, OR management, nursing staff. And we decided that if we would have a clamping of a lung after 10 o'clock in the evening, we would start the transplant at 7 o'clock in the morning. Yeah. Um, and then already quite soon after the first few cases, you have these cases coming up between 7 or 8 in the evening and 10 and 10. And what were you going to do? Because last time it was so nice to sleep and the patient <laughs> did very well and he had no PGD at, at time 72. So could we not shift a little? And what you see now, and this happens, I must say, retrospectively, seen quite natural. And in a period of, of only a few months, we started 1st of January 2023. We are now beginning of November, and now we have shifted towards when there is a clamping after six or seven in the evening, like they do in, in Toronto, then we keep the lungs stored in the office of the nurse, locked in the OR, and we start in the morning between seven and eight uh, with a fresh team. Wow. And, and it, it went quite natural. In the beginning, of course, everyone had to be convinced, and, and it was important to have everyone's input because we could not compromise the outcome of, for our patients. So we were lucky that we had um, that we had this this research already performed by by by, by other international teams, and we, we could stand on these first initial feasibilities and safety trials. And then we had also the luck that we were doing this 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 clinical research and that we were keeping a record of all our cases to a very detailed level. And it's always good when you start changing your your um, your program or the way you handle things that you record what you're doing. And so these two came together at the beginning of the year, and from then on, 
it flew it flew quite natural. I, I mean, I, I think those synergies just happen sometimes in uh, type, type, at times of, of evolution of, of new technologies. And I think it, it should be underscored one of the things you said that the, the intentional extension of ischemic time, um, you know, would have been quite provocative, quite co- uh, counterintuitive historically. But it's it sounds like your experience has been been strong. It's you're, you're doing that now as routine clinical practice, it sounds like. Um, and, and purpose-wise, when we talk to different institutions around this concept of, of sort of time shifting, of, of shifting the times, they, uh, institutions use it for different ends and different purposes. Um, Pretty, you've, you've spoken to institutions around, yeah. the, around the world about this. Yeah, you know, we, we speak to lung transplant programs on a weekly basis, and the interest to shift the timing of the procedure for transplantation is, is widespread. Every program is thinking about it. I think what's really interesting about Leuven is that, you know, what I understand is that that indication, you know, can sometimes be from a time perspective, but sometimes it can be for another indication, clinical consideration. Can you share with us a little bit about what what are some of those examples where you might shift the start, uh, transplant timing uh, beyond just the cross clamp? That's a very important topic, and I'm happy that you, that you raised it, because for me, it's far beyond night bridging. What I call it, it is introducing flexibility without compromising the outcome. So we have to safeguard the outcome. Mm-hmm. We're doing it now for a year. We didn't see any adverse effects so far. So we are quite confident. And also with the with the data coming up from the registry and, and other centers, we're quite confident that we don't compromise the outcome. But this introducing flexibility has several several aspects. First of all, you have the avoidance of the nocturnal transplant and trying to shift it during the day, which have several advantages. Maybe we can come back to them later. Um, And then you have the the concept of logistical limitations, which also impacts the, in a direct way, your lung transplant. For example, today, right now, we have a case um, going on of controlled hypothermic preservation because of the fact that we had a difficult oncological multidisciplinary case planned this morning, and we had limited OR capacity. So we had to choose between the transplant on the one hand, which is always an emergency for patients waiting for one, two years. And then you have these patients with a complex oncological um, problem that need to be electively planned. And so it's always a very difficult um, choice between them. What I mean with introducing flexibility is that we don't have to make that choice these days. Mm -hmm. This morning, we we performed, my colleagues performed the case of of the the difficult oncological surgical procedure, and we could easily shift towards this afternoon, three o'clock, four o'clock in the afternoon with the transplant dish, which was procured this morning between eight and 10 in in another hospital. And so in only one year ago, Probably we would have declined this lung effort just because we had no capacity of performing the transplant, or we had to postpone this difficult to plan multidisciplinary oncological case. Yeah, and so this just gives a lot of flexibility. And with this flexibility, you also see that there are less arguments between different caretakers. Right? You can imagine mm-hmm. that if someone has to has to cancel their program and everything that is related to that. And you have someone who really wants to push the lung transplant program, that this might lead to some um, some, some difficulties uh, within the hospital, but sometimes also within a department. And I'm happy that, that with this controlled hypothermic storage, we increase our flexibility to ca- take care of all patients in the best possible way. There's a second. Um, part of flexibility. And then the third part of flexibility, and I think that's also a very important one, is that we see that the quality of available organs is really declining rapidly. Mm -hmm. We don't see the same quality lungs anymore as we did 20 years ago. Luckily, we have less trauma with young people. um, But what we we face now are are, are people who, who, who have been smoking, or people who have been admitted to the hospital for two, three weeks with a lung exposed to, to ventilator-associated pneumonia or injury, um, patients who have been um, exposed to other detrimental factors during their life, a lot of comorbidities, age is also an important factor. 
And so you have this, what we call extended criteria uh, organs more and more together mm -hmm. with, uh, with a higher rate of, of DCD organs. And so what I think is really important for these organs that you limit your ischemic injury as much as possible. And you can do that in two ways. Either you further limit the time of ischemia, which is already now tried to, to be around six to eight hours. If you have to, to squeeze it further, mm -hmm. that will become a logistical nightmare. And you also decrease, especially in North America and other regions of the world, you decrease the, the transport time a lot and, and, and these logistical issues. Or you find a preservation mode which just decreases the cellular injury that is performed to these already very sensitive organs. And I think mm -hmm. that's, that's a third one. And therefore, um, I would like to refer to, to a recent case. I think we did now a month ago where I had, it was a Sunday afternoon, if I recall well, Pratik, mm -hmm. where I had an offer from, from, a, from a suitable 94-year-old donor. It's probably the oldest right. lung donor um, ever recorded in the world. And I called Pratik and I said, listen, this organ has been exposed for almost a century <laughs> to our environment. We just have to preserve it in the best possible way to make it a success. And, and we agreed to put it in the, in the lung guard. Although it was not for an extended preservation, it was just to create the most optimal environment for that lung. I mean, that's... that's absolutely incredible i mean and this these lungs started their journey on this planet long before lung transplantation even existed as a discipline and now they're starting a new life and a new patient how's the recipient doing the recipient is excellent he went home after i think two to three weeks wow he had not been seen any complication and he's doing very well i'm looking forward to his pulmonary function at, at three months and we will present this case at uh, at this ishlt symposium of course yeah. I mean, it's li literally a different generation that the lungs have now gone into, right, um, where they were originally. Um, I think it was really fascinating how you just covered the three kind of areas, how you think about, um, you know, what controlled hypothermic preservation allows you to do. And as you were talking, I couldn't help but think what this allows you to do is really make sure you get the right donor organ at the right time with the right team to the right recipient. Um, and that's quite quite fascinating. And I think, uh, like you said, in 20, 30 years ago, this was not even possible. So, so I have to ask, when you go out and do these procurements, you have other team members there too, right, from other, for other organs. Um, what's, what's been their experience? What is some of their feedback or reaction to now the lung team being able to kind of schedule their procedures? The lung team was always a bit lagging behind eh, because they were coming in sooner than, for example, the, the heart, they were leaving later. They had to rush to the hospital, transplant immediately. The, the, the kidney team is already um, reclining from doing um, nocturnal transplant for many years. Mm. And so all of a sudden, this lung transplant team takes a big leap and they see <laughs> that we're going to sleep. If there's another team in the morning taking care of these organs. And so, of course, they're interested to see if the same technology could extend their preservation times as well. I think for kidney, it's not it's not a major issue because we have learned um, with these machine perfusion technologies that we can keep also marginal organs for uh, extended preservation times. But I think, especially for the liver, they're very interested to see if, if the same same would, would happen uh, as well because the whole logistical challenge of putting an organ on a machine where you try to maintain it hypothermic, normal thermic, perfused um, for, for a longer time, it's also a logistical nightmare. And what they see now is that we come back to Leuven. It's also in a device, but we put the device um, unguarded in, in a locked room and we, we track the temperature on, on, on our phones and um, we, we, the whole team goes to sleep. And that, that's, a, that's a big difference with, with the logistical challenge of keeping an organ perfused. There's always someone who needs to be there to, to safeguard the organ and see yeah. that, that nothing happens. Yeah. That, that's a major difference. So also other organs are interested. And I must say that the, the experience with the heart team uh, and, and, uh, and uh, the heart registry that we have with this higher temperature mm -hmm. really um, is, is, a, is a lightning example for the other organs, how this preservation technology not only, not only better safeguards and give you more flexibility, but that it also actually improves the condition. Well, not improve, but in, 
comparison to the standard storage of Irish, mm -hmm. how the how the short and long term outcome or improved. Yeah, absolutely. I, can I can I ask? I mean, coming back to the on the one hand, uh, I think your points two and three in terms of of the use of the technology to create that flexibility. Um, you know, that potentially makes org more organs available to more patients, which is just just remarkable, you know, because you have the right teams available. Um, you can coordinate these challenges where you in, ha in the past may have had to turn things down. But I also, I, I, you, you touched on a couple times the, the idea of avoiding nighttime procedures. I have to imagine it, it, one of the one of the things about transplant is that it's, it's such an intensive uh, field that in the middle of the night, all of a sudden you have to leave uh, you have to cancel your cases. The burden and burnout that is faced by teams is is a real thing. Um, can can you tell me a little bit? Uh, I think I think the f idea of avoiding nighttime procedures is is not to be underestimated. Its impact on a program. Yeah, so I think that that this that it is indeed indeed true that for a long time the transplant surgeon or transplant physician has been seen as someone who doesn't like to sleep, who <laughs> likes to work during the night, during the case, then during the day, staying, waking up, uh, staying up for 36 hours. I can tell you it's, it's not true. Okay. We also like to sleep. <laughs> and I must say, just from my own perspective, how my life has changed hmm. after um, the introduction of this controlled hypothermic preservation. When you do a night transplanted complex case at Sunday night, going to the Monday morning where you have your elective case plan, your whole week is ruined. Mm -hmm. right? yeah. And and it's just better from my own perspective mm -hmm. to have regular sleep. But that that's just my own perspective. But no, I think no disagreement important, there. <laughs> <laughs> but I think it's important that to consider in avoiding nocturnal transplants, it that there are different benefits. Yeah? But they are mostly related to what I call human factors. You take care of the, of the patient, that, that's one factor, and then maybe the patient will, in the end, benefit from the fact that the organ is better preserved. That, that, that's one aspect that we touched already. The other aspect is the aspect on the quality for the, the human factors of the transplant team. First of all, I think that reducing time pressure on the young colleagues who are going out for procurement and who have to decide in a remote hospital without not always a lot of experience if they should accept the organ or not, knowing that if they accept it, they have to assist the transplant the whole night and then do a whole day shift. Yeah? So they are always in some subjective bias that if they accept the organ, they inflict their own night rest. Yeah? And so you take away that, that pressure and you shift it just to a very objective decision for them. Should I avoid this organ? Is the quality of or this organ good enough for the patient who needs, who needs mm -hmm. this, this transplant? Yeah? And that's one important aspect. You improve the objectivity. That, that, that's one thing that should not be overlooked. The other thing is, of course, the fitness of the team. I think when you have a fit team, you reduce the likelihood of errors, mm -hmm. no matter how you see it. And I, I agree that there are conflicting literature on that, especially in the field of transplantation, where another systematic review of our own look showed analyzing more than 300,000 patients who had either yes or I don't know a night transplant, that there was not a real impact on short or long term outcome. However, most of these analyses have been done for kidney and there can be several biases in this research. But if you compare it to, to general surgery or trauma surgery or whatever, you just see that the, the, the fitter the team is, mm -hmm. the less you have a reduction of errors. Yeah? And the more expertise, especially in the field of transplantation, you gain during the daytime, especially for mm -hmm. Leuven, for example, um, I can tell you that our philosophy is to do a transplant without extracorporeal life support. Mm -hmm. But if we need it, it needs to be there. And then the cardiac surgeons have to come over. If they have to come over at two o'clock at night from home to put a patient urgently on ECMO, or if they have to come over from a nearby OR during the day, that makes a big difference. Mm -hmm. yeah? So just the whole, and also regarding the anesthesiologist, during the day we have a, we have a specialized 
um, thoracic anesthesiology team there, which is not always the case during the night. So there's just more, more, um, more expertise. And all these factors will result in, in also less burnout. There has been a very interesting um, cross-sectional anonymous survey of the American College of Surgeons who captured, I think, around 8,000 surgeons. Mm -hmm. yeah? mm -hmm. And they are important an association of burnout and decreased career satisfaction with nighttime surgery. Mm -hmm. And there was a significantly higher proportion of surgeons who said that they would not consider surgery as a profession again. So I think avoiding this nighttime surgery will also increase the attractivity of the of the profession and the retention uh, of the of the transplant person. That, yeah. That's a very powerful data point. I think you know uh, before COVID, the the idea of, of a CEO of a hospital paying attention to burnout was not was not a major topic. But I think we're hearing that across the board in terms of staffing challenges burnout challenges, not only it sounds like you're getting the best, most specialized people that you can arrange during the day, but for the program sustainability to you know, retain young talent, to keep them in the profession, there's a, a huge investment of time and effort to, to get uh, a professional to the point that they're, they're a transplant attending or, or any of the, the specialized support staff. Um, and to lose that because of burnout is is got to be a huge program cost to suddenly have that gap and have to retrain someone new to fill those roles. I, I would assume. That's absolutely true, Michael. And um, also, I must say from my own perspective, uh, I raise a, a young family. I have three small children. I have a newborn this year. Just being able to sleep and be there for them in the weekend and not be tired the whole weekend and and do things together with them. That's, that increases your, your quality of, of life as well. And it has a positive feedback loop in, in both directions, I think. It's, yeah. it's really not to be underestimated. These young professionals, they, they also have, have, have young families and, and then they are forced to, to work two, three times a week at night. And then it also leads at home to difficult situations, I, I can imagine. So it, it's better to have that in a good balance. So. As, as someone with three kids, um, the, the fact that you, you could in addition to losing sleep from the newborn and then also have to lose sleep for staying up all night for cases. I can imagine that's got to be yeah. brutal. I mean, it's, it's, it's striking to me when you think about uh, professions outside of medicine, right? Especially professions which require a lot of um, high cognitive ability and, and focus. I can't really think of any other profession which is expected to not sleep for 36 hours and then perform at that high level, right? You think about pilots, you think about other really high intense sports, um, people get good sleep. But when it comes to surgery, like you mentioned, it's almost kind of, you know, historically something that people have to deal with. Yeah, yeah, I agree, I agree on that. And I think we have to evolve more towards these, um, these controlled systems like, like aviation, yeah. where we just safeguard not only the patients, but also the one who executes the procedure. Can I, can I just briefly go back to the 94-year-old donor that you mentioned? I think what was interesting is, was you know, you've done research and published from the, the Leuven team about how donor age is potentially something that we should reconsider as, as a risk factor. What was particularly interesting about this case was not only is it potentially the oldest donor, but it was also a donation after circulatory death lung, if I remember correctly. Can you talk yeah. to us a little bit about both of those risk factors and, you know, at least historically been risk factors and how the team came to the point where they felt comfortable with this type of donor lung? Yeah, so uh, that, that's a very important uh, topic, uh, Pratik. And that's what I call with our experience in, in extended criteria donation, which has grown over two decades. In, in Belgium and in Europe, we don't face the same kind of donor as, as you face in, in North America. Yeah. What we face is the 50 to 60 year olds who might have been smoking with comorbidities. Um, and in most of the cases, in, in many cases, which in the end becomes a donation of the circulatory debt or DCD. Our program alone accounts um, in 40% of cases, it, it accounts for DCD. Um, and what has been shown, not only by us, but by the whole international uh, community, and there's a very strong paper from, from ISHLT on that, is that there's no difference in, in outcome 
regarding DCD lung versus donation after brain dead lung. Yeah? Um, and that is different than, for example, in comparison to kidney or liver, where you see a more detrimental outcome uh, with DCD. And the, pro the, the, the reason probably is that, that lungs are quite unique and privileged because they have this oxygen storage and they are less prone to this first warm ischemia. As long as they are ventilated, a lung is somehow protected. Yeah? So regarding DCD, we have built a very strong experience and we are not afraid and we do not consider anymore a DCD lung as, as an additional risk factor as it is used to be in the North America or as it used to be in, in, in more than a decade ago at, at our own center. So we're very confident with accept, accepting good DCD. A good DCD um, might even be sometimes better than, 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 than the DBD mm -hmm. who has been ventilated for, for, for two weeks. And then last year, indeed, we were able to show for the first time that in our retrospective uh, series in Leuven, we performed a propensity-matched analysis of all donors that were transplanted beyond the age of 70 years, yeah. and we compared them to donors under 70 years. And I think we had a comparison of a median age of 74 years versus 54, so a, a difference, uh, a significant difference of, of 20 years between these two groups. All other parameters were the same, and we have seen this, in this propensity-matched analysis that there was no difference in short, neither in the long-term outcome. What we did observe was that we were more selective if we chose uh, or accepted an, an, older, an older donor. So I think calendar age should be interpreted as a um, relative risk factor. But the most important is to look at the actual biological age of that donor. What are the comorbidities? Um, how has he or she lived? Has he been smoking? What's the BMI? and to have a good understanding of how marginal that organ is in this extended criteria donor is more important than focusing on calendar age. I can yeah. tell you this 94-year-old donor was still uh, living on his own, doing activities, riding a bike. And just this tells you that this whole body has a, has a younger biological age than some of the organs that, that we see at 49 or 50 years old. So and Based on this experience with this 94-year-old donor, we're setting up a whole research line on the impact of um, age on, on donation and transplantation. And one of the new PhD students will start on this on this next year. So, so there's some truth to when people say age is just a number, at least when it comes to, to, to donor lungs. That's, that's really fascinating. And, and the fact that you guys have now kicked off an entire research focus on that. Absolutely, absolutely. I'm curious, actually, as your team's gotten aggressive towards evaluating uh, more and more extended criteria or marginal uh, organs, how uh, how is, have you viewed different technologies? You said you've used controlled hypothermia. Do you also use EVLP towards that? Is that part of your strategy towards extended criteria? So we have been involved in Leuven um, in the in the in the clinical practice of, of ex vivo lung perfusion. Um, at the moment of the, of the start of the clinical trials, we were involved in the INSPIRE trial, in the EXPAND trial, which was assessing donor organs with the OCS uh, technology, which was normothermic um, perfusion um, and ventilation with, with whole blood. And what we have learned not only from, from these trials, but also from the Vienna trial, etc., was that despite the logistical challenges that were performed, there was no impact to be seen on, on PGD on its own, on mm -hmm. primary graft uh, dysfunction. And so um, for the, the real indication, I think, that remains for ex vivo lung perfusion currently is assessing um, questionable donor lungs. Yeah? And this is how EVLP technology is, is used throughout the world, especially for um, DCD lungs. However, in Leuven, as I explained, we have a very we have built a very strong experience with DCD, and so we don't feel the need to um, assess these lungs on the on, on ex vivo with ex vivo lung perfusion. Um, we assess them um, based on the criteria we have from from the donor and our own experience, and we also look at at how the recipient is. 
Um, and so we don't use it in, in, in that field at any, anymore. Uh, I think what we have also experienced over the past is that some of these lungs, which might be transplantable, gets a, get edematous on the, on the machine, which is normal mm -hmm. because they go through a first phase of ischemia and hyperfusion. But then it's just ch more challenging to transplant an edematous lung with less exposure um, leading to more uh, surgical complications. And so it might be more um, understandable to let that ischemia and perfusion injury to have that cytotoxic storm mm -hmm. after um, actual hyperfusion in the, in the patient. And because then you can, you can handle this with um, better ventilation uh, strategies or the use of ECMO postoperatively, but you don't lose that, that organ and you don't make the transplant as, as mm -hmm. complex as this. Mm -hmm. So I think I think EVLP is still there and we are using EVLP um, again in the in the near future. One of my colleagues is is leading that, that project and we will um, we will use it probably in, in, in a research setting as well um, for questionable um, donor lungs. We will not use it anymore to extend preservation like we have done in the past. I recall a case that we published in the American Journal of Transplantation where we did a combined liver lung transplantation and we were forced due to the nature of the disease of the patient to transplant the liver first. So we kept the lung on the machine for almost 12 hours um, to transplant it then afterwards in, in the recipient. Um, looking at it back now, it seems Quite, quite strange to do it because with such lung preservation um, times on, on the machine, you might actually damage the lung, we have learned. Mm. And nowadays for these cases, we would always use the, the strategy of controlled hypothermic storage. So I think there's no indication for EVLP anymore in, in controlled preservation, but where I see the real indication is where I see real indication is in the allograft treatment and modulation. I call it ATM, the money is in the ATM, mm -hmm. yeah? Mm -hmm. That's where you have to use it. Mm -hmm. And also Toronto has been leading that path, showing that with genetic modification, that's actually what we are doing right now in the lab. We are genetically modifying red lungs when they are on the EVLP. And this out of body ex vivo modification just has so many potential advantages that I see a transition to the clinics in, in the future. Yeah. yeah I you know, it's really interesting. Um, the ex vivo lung perfusion uh, approaches are, are are quite interesting, and and I and if I remember correctly, a lot of those trials happened before controlled hypothermic storage was even a preservation option, right? So that all those control groups that ex vivo lung perfusion technologies were uh, studying was against ice storage. Um, so so to me, that's really interesting. Um, you know, that basically teams have now made a leap. Uh, from ice storage beyond EVLP for the most part to controlled hypothermic storage. I think one of the things you touched on, I think, that, that is interesting, and I think, again, this is sort of that crossing over of disciplines. And one of the things we're, we're hearing from physicians in the, the NRP space, particularly in, on heart, is uh, that when you have the, the, the full complement of the physiology of the body, the, the, the recovery of the organ, the, the, the impact on the organ is really different than just uh, sort of replacing blood and circulating in isolation. So I, I think that's, that's a yeah. fascinating sort of aspect to it. Yeah, and, and just to build off of that, Dr. Kumas, I also know that your team, uh, at, at one point, if I'm not mistaken, you know, did NRP, um, at least the heart team did, right? And, and your team feels pretty comfortable um, taking donor lungs from NRP cases. Can you share a little bit more about that? Because I know that's also really a hot topic in the US, whether donor lungs from an NRP case are viable for transplantation. So I think uh, indeed NRP has been performed in, in Leuven and we have transplanted some lungs with NRP with, with good results. I was involved in these cases as well. The benefit for the lung itself was that you could do the actual assessments of the donor lungs mm. um, after mm -hmm. that the, the body was, was recirculated. And so what I remember, what I recall from these cases is that, that I actually drew some blood gases from the pulmonary veins in situ after the heart beat was, was beating again. So you could assess, which was therefore never possible in a DCD setting, and therefore you had to use the machine to, to do a proper assessment. 
what I think is really critical um, in NRP, besides the, the ethical um, challenges that we are still facing, but they're working on that. There are studies currently being performed to, to assess the, the fact if the reperfusion leads to, to uh, brain reperfusion or not. But ex uh, except for that, uh, besides that, I think it's important to consider that the lung transplant programs were not um, hampered or limited by the driving force of the cardiac uh, physicians and, and surgeons to uh, accept, accept hearts instead of, instead of lungs. And I think as a lung transplant community, we have to safeguard the fact that DCD lungs are equally allocated um, in regards to the use of NRP. What I understood from North American colleagues was that in the first analysis of the UNOS data, it seemed that with the um, implementation of, of NRP, um, there was a relative decrease of the use of, of suitable lungs. Yeah. Um, I think overall NRP is really important because it is um, a whole strategy that will dramatically increase the um, possibility of, of heart transplantation. But um, yeah, we really have to have to develop international protocols that, that safeguard the lungs. One of these is that you have to take into account that we need to monitor that this recirculation does not, not harm the lung. One of the most important aspects is that I think is the is the uh, to to avoid an, an overflow of the lung and that you need to to vent the lungs properly during NRP, um, and we're working on that. Also with the European Society of Thoracic Surgery, this year coming up in Barcelona, we will have a special session dedicated to that. Um, that's, that's fantastic. Uh, the special session on uh, NRP to, to really look into that issue. I think that's definitely called for at this time. I want to come back to something you had mentioned a little bit earlier. So it sounds like the historic time frames that you'd use for cold ischemic times might have been on the order of six to eight hours. With controlled hypothermia, how how long are you going? Uh, how what is acceptable to your team for uh, a, a lung to maintain uh, a cold ischemic time? That's a very good question, Michael. Um... I can tell you that the longest preservation we did now was 22 hours, um, two minutes. 22 um, hours. 22 wow. hours. It was not uh, preservation. Um, the whole thing. It, it's what I call ischemia time. Ischemia yeah. time. Cross clamp to cross clamp. Or... So preservation over um, 18 or 20 hours, I think, in the in the lung guard. And so I must say at the end of the procedure, it was, the reason to do it was first, it was bridging the night. Second, it was a very complex, uh, complex case. Um, so we needed a lot of, of specialty um, during the day. And then it was also a very complex case in regard to the explant of the lungs. And so it, just the whole surgery took a lot of time to do it uh, steadily. Um, and then after these 22 hours, the lung was reperfused. And I must say it was really very, very compliant. You know, what you sometimes have when you have a, an organ preserved on ice for such a long time that it just it's really cold. It's like taking a steak out of the fridge. It's it's cold and hard, yeah? Yeah. And, and it just isn't compliant. This one was really elastic and and compliant, and so that that made us very confident to indeed routinely use this this extended preservation. And I think um, we have now gathered um, we have sent an abstract for the ISHLT next year gathering, I think, almost 15 cases of extended preservation, which means ischemia times beyond 15 hours. And in not a single one of them, we have seen PGD grade three at 72 hours. Wow. So wow. I think for us, this, this, is, this, is, this is not, um, not a problem to, to extend preservation for that long. I think probably the limits with this technology, if I look back to the old literature, is probably around 24 hours. And I say this because what you see with this controlled hypothermic preservation, controlled hypothermic preservation is avoiding freezing injury, but at the same time, keeping an equilibrium to, between the, the aerobic metabolism that is performed and the oxygen consumption. And probably after 24 hours, 
a lot of this oxygen has been um, consumed. Um, we don't know this for sure. This is based on, on literature from more than almost 30 years ago, and where they did experiments and measured um, oxygen saturations over time. But I think probably around 24 hours is, is, is the current limit. If you find a way to replace the oxygen, um, we might even further extend that. And I refer you also to a, a paper of Toronto where they did the pick experiments and kept the lungs viable for, for three days. So what I think you have to imagine, it's more like um, in a very naive way may, maybe, but you, this, this mitochondria, you have to keep them viable. Mm -hmm. And these are the batteries of your cells. And you have to refuel them after a while. So what they did was they had these pick lungs, they were preserved, then they were refueled with four hours of EVLP, then preserved again, refueled again, and so by doing this, you can you can extend the, the preservation for a longer time. In the liver now, they can pre pre preserve uh, livers for up to up to seven days. Yeah? And if you get into that um, time limit, and I think it's possible, I think it should be possible over time, then you get a situation where you might think about focusing more on um, trying to create tolerance in your recipient because that gives you the opportunity to take donor cells i think about donor regulatory t cells expand them out of the body that that requires time and give them to the recipient before you actually transplant the organ yeah? and so over time since the beginning of transplantation there have been developed so many protocols to trying to make to to reduce the need for immunosuppression of transplantation by by making the the whole uh, transplant procedure more 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 um, more proto protolorogenic, but it always requires time. And if you can buy time with extended preservation, you can focus on the on the really whole grail of transplantation, which is creating tolerance. That's fascinating. That's fascinating. Um, I was speaking with a laboratory researcher who's been in in perfusing organs for a long time, and he uses this analogy of uh, it's like if you introduced two dogs in a fight, they will never get along ever again. If if you can introduce them as friends, they'll be best friends forever. And and this is sort of to what he was saying about getting in organs uh, in a state that, that will uh, lead to the best outcomes, um, but doing so in a way that you can create time, that you can extend the, the flexibility and the coordination of everything you need to do to pull off this this incredible procedure. It's truly amazing. Dr. Kuhlmans, one of the things you mentioned, which is really interesting, was about the use of uh, oxygen over the preservation period. Uh, that's actually another interest for us from a research perspective. We, we recently got a new technology cleared uh, by the FDA, not yet CE marked, that the goal is to maintain inflation pressure of donor lungs between the site of donation to the site of transplantation. Um, you know, these pressures can vary based on how the lungs are packaged, but also during the transport period, they actually, we've seen that the, pre the pressure goes down. And with that, the oxygen level also goes down. So one of the benefits that I'd love to talk to you, um, you know, more is how this type of preservation could potentially retain the oxygen concentration that you talked about and how we could extend preservation. So I'm, I'm curious, since we're on that topic, from an from a inflation uh, standpoint, you know, we've talked a lot about temperature. Uh, in, inflation as a parameter of preservation, what, what are your thoughts on that, the importance of, in focusing on that? So I mean, where I see this going is that we're going towards uh, a technology where you try to control as many parameters as possible. And the first logical parameter was temperature because you, you can you can do that quite quite easily with current technology. There are two other parameters which, which are crucial in uh, lung preservation, and that is uh, pressure. And pressure is related to volume. Um, with, with the physical law of Boyle and Mariot, this is just uh, correlated. So pressure is is volume, mm -hmm. and then you have oxygen. Um, I see that there is a that there is, of course, uh, a correlation between volume and, and oxygen. Um, but what I'm really talking about is, is oxygen consumption. Mm -hmm. You start after inflation of a lung, you can have your two of 50%. Otherwise, if you start too high, 
you have too much oxidative uh, radicals, free oxidative radicals. So you start around 50%, and you try to maintain that that oxygen because it is consumed by by the by the cells. Um, what you do with with a lung that is transported over the air and where the pressure and the volume shifts because you transport your organ at different heights is that the oxygen is still consumed in the in the same way and the number of oxygen particles just diffuses over the volume with which the lung is inflated you know? mm. um, but what you actually have to measure is is how many oxygen particles are present in in that lung and is there a way to maintain that 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 oxygen um, oxygen level in in the lung over time that's still something else than and maintaining pressure, I think, mm -hmm. um, because if you're able to maintain pressure with the bar guard, which, by the way, I'm really looking forward <laughs> to use myself, then then if you can maintain the, 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 the pressure, then the next step would be trying to maintain the, the oxygen. Yeah. 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 One of the things that we were hypothesizing is that the, the partial pressure of oxygen is actually higher. So as O2 is being used up, the inflation pressure is actually going down. Um, and so the system would actually reintroduce uh, room air oxygen and bring the pressure up, but also the concentration back up. But well, we could talk about that um, a, a little bit more too uh, to get your thoughts on. That, yeah, and it would be interesting because it's about finding the right uh, oxygen concentration you need for optimal lung preservation. Mm -hmm. It's the same question as you had with the temperature. temperature. What is the optimal temperature? Right. And here the question is, what is the ox optimal oxygen concentration? Right. Um, I, I recall some other old literature where I've seen that that the first two hours with an oxygen concentration of 2 of 50% is more detrimental than an oxygen concentration of 21%. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it could be that the optimal oxygen concentration is somewhere in between. Mm -hmm. And that will be crucial if we want to further extend the, the preservation of these of these organs. So that's a topic for another day. I'm, yeah, I'm happy to have with you. This, <laughs> this this will continue this this discussion. Yeah. All right. Well, I'd I'd really like to thank you for making time. I'm, we're we're incredibly thrilled to have you here today. I thought it was a, a great discussion. Thank you for making the time. I, I want to take a moment. It, it, what do you think in terms of major initiatives or or important areas that we should highlight to to the community uh, before we go? That that is our top of mind to you and or to your program. I think that the community should consider that, that the transplantation in general is a very unique field and that we face more and more challenges by a very limited um, organ donor pool. It's very hard to find quality organs and um, I think the whole community should realize that every one of us is a potential donor. And we should consider that um, at the moment when when we're able to after we pass away that we are able to 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 donate you know? um, and it's important not to have some um, general policies around it but just discuss it with your um, with your family with your friends what is your wish at the moment that you would become a potential donor that is just discussed up front and this on itself might have a positive impact on the potential donor pool. We are developing so many complex strategies like xenotransplant, developing CRISPR-modified pigs, just to increase the potential donor pool. Um, and, and we all walk around with, with potential organs, which we shouldn't take to heaven when we can still use them here. I think that's, that's extraordinarily well said. You know, uh, there's, there's such a... a rich resource pool here that um, is is so critical to help more patients and that uh, we, we truly do have to make the most out of every potential donor out there and find every strategy possible. Um, but it's something that we all need to take uh, internally to our own lives of wh the way we, we're going to play a role in this uh, whole ecosystem. Well, thank you. That's this has been a fantastic discussion. Uh, really, really do appreciate it. Are there any other areas you'd like to highlight before we go? Um, I, I indeed would like to highlight a special event that's coming up. And that's the 
annual European Society of Thoracic Surgery Conference coming up from 26 to 28 of May 2024. Um, it is the uh, held in, in Barcelona. The European Society of Thoracic Surgery is in fact the largest community of thoracic surgeons, world, thoracic surgeons worldwide. And I was appointed last year as chair of the committee of transplantation. And so what we really pushed forward this year was to have more transplant related sessions. And I'm happy to announce and to advertise that we will have transplant related sessions every day. The first day is a Sunday. We will have a specific topic on basic science and how lungs can be generally modified by being on ex vivo lung perfusion. Um, on Monday, um, I can tell you that we will have two transplant sessions of which one is really focused uh, entirely about the impact of normodermic regional perfusion on lung transplantation, which is a very hot topic and which will be chaired by Shafke Shafshi from Toronto and Konrad Hutzenegger from Vienna. And then um, I'm really proud to announce that on Tuesday morning, we will have a Sunrise Symposium organized um, together with, with the European Society of Organ Transplantation and together with Irene Bayo, I will share that session, which is completely centered around the topic of hypothermic storage, highlighting a state of the art on the protective mechanisms of controlled hypothermic storage and a co-com debate on the um, logistics um, in, in uh, avoiding nocturnal transplantation. So we're really looking forward. We will advertise this throughout the year and I call every physician um, related to lung transplantation to come to that event and share their thoughts with us. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. That sounds like a fantastic agenda. Um, we'll hopefully see you there in uh, May. Uh, and anyone out there, we, we hope you all uh, join Professor Kuhlemans and the group uh, in Barcelona. Thank you so much, Dr. Kuhlmans. Really appreciate you making the time today. And thank you, everyone, for listening, wherever you are. We appreciate you joining for this episode. Uh, if you enjoyed this, we're, we're just getting started. We're going to be putting out more episodes. So stay tuned. Follow us on social media for the latest news or visit us at paragonics.com. Thank you very much.